John Anglo called Public Affairs Center. Mm -hmm. And I've been talking about climate data in India. Yeah, a few sort of analyses that I think are interesting. So, Public Affairs Center is uh, a small organization that primarily works on governance and public services. And around two years ago, we started a small group called the Environmental Governance Group. So, primarily, uh, as a part of the group, we try to look at how to promote um, resilience to environmental and climate changes in local areas uh, across the country. And as a part of this, so a, a large focus of ours is on climate change adaptation, promoting it from the bottom up uh, to sort of hopefully complement, you know, big national schemes that are sort of doing the rounds. So as a part of this, what we found was that we had to, when you go down to a small area, I mean, we are working in Wayanad in Kerala, in uh, the Gulf of Mannar, like Rameshwaram in Tamil Nadu. And like, we're all in Bangalore, so we're interested in how things happen here. So, one thing we found was that before you start talking about climate change, climate change impacts, this carbon dioxide going up, all that, we don't have enough awareness about what our climate really is. So, um, like, I, I contrast the Indian way of, Indian style of education with, say, the American where they start from their town and county and state and then go up to the world, where their world geography is rubbish, but they know their local areas really well. In India, we start from the country and then we go up to the world and it's sort of almost degrading to study about Karnataka or, you know, a district in school. And so it's like, uh, that spills over into uh, a lot of our thinking. So when you want to understand climate, climate of India, does not make too much sense to me. I mean, it's a very large thing. If you're studying the macro effects of the monsoon, sure. But what about the climate of Bangalore? What about the climate of Mysore, Ramnagaram? We need that level of granularity to really start making sense. So I'll just do a very brief overview of uh, how climate data is structured in India. I mean, who uh, generates it, who has it. The Indian Meteorological Department is the hegemon. I mean, they're the overlords. They're a very old organization, around 170, 180 years old. And they've been collecting a lot of data across the country since then. So, in fact, India has one of the best uh, rec uh, instrumental records in the world. But the problem is there's lots of data, but there's no data really available in the public, or very, very little. So, but I would, again, I'd temper this statement by saying that things are getting better at a rapid rate. There are lots of meetings like these, lots of people who are trying to put pressure get more out. Um, so, the Indian Meteorological Department maintains a lot of weather stations. So, they collect all kinds of data, starting from rainfall and temperature and moving on to humidity and the list goes on. Uh, for reduction, especially for this lot, we can stick to rainfall and temperature and actually I'll be talking mostly about rainfall. Only. <coughs> Apart from the IMD, almost everybody, every state department that you can think of will have a rain gauge somewhere. I mean, they'll be doing it for somebody else, but uh, you have uh, rain gauges across Karnataka in schools, in, um, you know, town mun municipal, uh, municipality buildings, in, in all kinds of places. So, not, uh, you won't get good quality data everywhere. I mean, you have somebody who is responsible for manually jotting down a number at the end of the day. Uh, so, that's, that's how data is collected. So, apart from that, you also have you know, the intrepid farmers, you have people who are so interested in the climate and they want to know how um, the local weather is, so they often do collect a lot of it. So, when it comes to the type of data or the source, so you have station data, this is your primary data that's collected at the source, and then you have gridded products. So, when you want to do big analysis, you want to sort of generate homogeneous data for a grid of any size. Uh, the conventional size is 1 degree by 1 degree, which is roughly like 110, 115 kilometers in size. So, it's a little bigger than, say, the district of Bangalore, if uh, you're looking for that. Um, so, the, the latest trend is satellite products. So, you have American satellites. There's one called TRMM, Tropical Rainfall Meteorological Mission or something like that. And you even have uh, some Indian satellites which collect a lot of data now through... Uh, imaging where they can deduce the amount of rainfall that actually occurs in real time. I mean, there's some fascinating work. And uh, India recently launched a satellite called the Megatrophics with, with France. 
uh, it's sad that while NASA is extremely uh, good about open data and puts a lot of it up to the public, Megatropic still doesn't really, I mean, it has a barely functional website which is half in French, half in English. So, this is one data set that I came across a year ago uh, called the Aphrodite rainfall data set. Don't ask me why they named it that, but so here what uh, some scientists in Japan have bought station data from across Asia and they want to, they've started uh, creating these gridded data products. And it, like I said, India has one of the best station densities that you can imagine. I mean, it's the best in Asia outside of Japan. And that's remarkable. And unfortunately, that doesn't always get, get reflected in our literature, in our scientific understanding. In fact, I, I want to make a caveat that this, the points that are plotted here are a subset of what really exists in India, only around 2000. So from that scale, I'll go down to one farmer in Bayanard who was like one of the first few BSc agriculture holders in the district and one morning in 1983 he decided you know what I'm going to buy a small little rain gauge which is essentially a calibrated funnel and I'm going to start collecting rainfall data. It's been 27 or 28 years now he hasn't stopped since. Amazing quality of data and when we met him last year we were the first people ever to have expressed an interest in this data so he was delighted that someone was willing to recognize his Hard work. This is Mr. Vimal Kumar. He is actually a Kannadiga, by the way. Um, so, so that that gives you a sense of what scales one can deal with. So, th this is again a snapshot of the um, the Japanese data set. So, here on a typical day, they give the number of rain gauges that exist across India. So, uh, Bangalore comes somewhere here, and so we have many. I mean, they have. On, on good days, they have six or seven in that little square box. So one of the themes that I want to sort of talk about here is, so, okay, going back, uh, given that there are a lot of people here who are a lot more savvy with big data analysis than I am, um, this gridded data is now available for non-commercial use. Anyone can download it. So IMD has its own gridded data sets, which are, more robust because there are more station data, but it's not really in the public domain. I mean, as a non-profit or an institution, you can buy it, you can use it and publish, but you cannot disseminate it in the public domain. Why would the number of the rain meters vary in a day? No, it, um, some, they might not have collected, they might not have reported data errors. And every data, station data, I mean, it costs money. So they don't want to, they want to, so they'll have algorithms to spend as little money as possible and get as much data as possible. So if you notice, the only missing points are usually, they correlate very highly with the Naxal affected and the forested areas of India. So one thing you can do is a lot of map based visualization. And this is stuff that I'm not good at, but I know that there are people here who are really good at it. And this is an open data set that people can use. What I am very interested in what is going local. What time series is this data? Wow. This is 1951 to 2007. So it's 2007. daily rain. Yes. Why? Why does it stop at 2007? Uh, well, it, the data set is around two years old. Oh, uh, what you have. But we, have, we have a very funny problem in India. In the whole request for gradation of technology, if you actually look at um, <coughs> the rain, the rain gauges and um, weather stations in India, they sort of drop off after a while because in, in the 2000s. Because... You've had historic continuity for 80, 100 years, and suddenly they decide, okay, let's build an automated weather station. The old record gets tossed out. So you'll have artifacts coming in. So um, I think most data sets end in the middle 2000s. Uh, hopefully, they'll get updated soon. Is that monthly aggregates or is that like daily? So it's very rich information. So, uh, so the first theme I want to look at is like going local. Uh, so what I've done is taken data from this particular grid box. It's a 0.25 by 0.25 degree grid box. So that's around just 25 by 25 kilometers roughly. So this particular grid, so they also had station data, but they don't mention what stations they take from. I mean, they have to sign some clauses there. But the two prominent stations in the Bangalore region are the, is the one in Maharani's College and the one at the old Bangalore airport. So most likely they would have taken from those 
and this station, this gridded data is like an underestimate of the station data. I mean, from what I can gather. So whatever I show you, the reality is that you can take it for granted that it's a bit more extreme by and large. So this is something that personally I have a lot of fun with, the joy of working with daily rainfall data. So this is, whenever people talk about rainfall profiles, this is what you see. Pick any place. So you have rainfall on one axis and by months they'll tell you uh, how much rainfall you've seen. So with Bangalore you can see that there is one summer rainfall period and a monsoon rainfall period. But this tells you very, very little. So I've just sort of squished it down to rainfall per day, where it comes to an average of 5 millimeters per day in the rainiest month. But then, I so this is 50, what's 57 years of data. So if I take daily averages, that is I average all the January 1st, all the February 1st and so on, it gives me a very, very different picture. And this is what, and I mean this, the first time I saw it, it was mind blowing. It, it shows you that not only do we have, we can, we almost have three rainfall regimes almost. This period between June and September in Bangalore, uh, where it really takes, picks up end of September, October, it rains a lot there. And then you have this period, the summer monsoon period. And then it's this distinct drop in rainfall. I mean, we conventionally think that monsoon comes in the 1st of June or the 5th of June or whatever. And we think it's rainy throughout, but in Bangalore, I mean, this is 50 years average, so this is fairly statistically significant that we have this mini drought period at the end of June. So, it's nuggets of information like these. I'm sure that any region of India, you plot this and you will get something new that you would not have found from a monthly average. So, from, so these are average rainfalls. This graph just shows you the probability of it. It's taken 50 years, all the number of days where you get more than 0 or more than 2 millimeters of rainfall in a day. So it shows you that on no day in Bangalore, you get, they have a chance of more than around 40 50 percent. So, and this sort of is there in our psyche now. We think that, oh, we never know when it's going to rain. But we have a Bayesian form where it's a percentage of rain given that it rained the previous day. We can do that. I mean, I haven't... I think that would be more interesting and you see higher peaks. Sure, I mean, we can do that. I haven't done it in my presentation. Uh, that's certainly something we can explore. But the point is, even this, you do not... I mean, I hadn't come across a daily analysis before. So, so this influences our psyche, right? Where we think that there's a 50-50 chance even in the rainy season, we don't know whether it will rain or not today. But if you look at the probability of it raining even one day in a week, it's almost 80-90% for a good period of the time. So, if you go from thinking, I don't know whether it will rain or not, to it will rain this week, it changes the way you behave, the chain changes the way you carry your umbrella, everything. And if you do your analysis, then it will you know, tell us even more. So, coming back to this, um, so this is the average, right? So, it, it includes days where it never rained. So, if you actually look at the amount of rain that fell when it rained, so the amount of rain per rainy day, it shows you a very different picture. So, it sort of goes by this adage, you know, when it rains, it pours. So, there are many days, especially in February, March, it uh, rains very rarely. When it does, it's quite a problem. <coughs> So this gives you, again, a lot of very different kinds of information. And when you go to the maximum recorded rainfall on any given day, it shows you that starting April all the way till December, you've had days where it's almost touched 100 mm. And here I really want to stress that this is an underestimate. Uh, if you look at station data, it will show you much more. I mean, I think recorded data, 180 millimeters is the maximum recorded in Bangalore's history. So, so anytime anyone tells you that, oh, we didn't expect 100 millimeters of rainfall this day in Bangalore, and so all the catastrophes are because we never expected it, sorry, it's a very bad excuse in public policy. We know that it's going to rain this way. About once a year, or 1.1 times a year, you get one day where it's 100 millimeters, and people die. I mean, you're not aware of it always, but 
So it's completely preventable. And this is not the Mumbai deluge of 2005, I think it was 2005, where, six, sorry, uh, when 1,000 centimeters of rainfall? Uh, sorry, one. 2005. 26 July. Right, so that, so that, that was one meter of rainfall. In, in uh, at high tide in within about two hours, right? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, that is, from a public policy angle, that's excusable. I mean, we, so that was a freak occurrence. Exactly. Super but 100 millimeters in Bangalore is not a freak occurrence. That, that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. And if we don't have our infrastructure in place where we can even sort of handle 100 millimeters in a place like Bangalore where, you know, runoff is very easy. I mean, water just flows out very easily. I mean, it's, it's terrible. It's pathetic. So another data source that I didn't mention in the back is so recently uh, the IMB has set up these automated weather stations and they've also set up automated rain gauges in a much larger number. So there's one in Bangalore which gives you hourly data, uh, pressure, temperature, rainfall, everything. And the only thing is they give you data for the last seven days and then that keeps changing. So what I did last year was I just went every week, copied, I mean very manually, just copied data week on week. And so this is just a picture from 10th August to 19, 20th September last year in the monsoon. So there was one day, 16th August, I don't know how many of you remember, it actually rained quite a bit, over 100 uh, millimeters, just after Independence Day. And a bunch of things happened. So what I'm going to show you here is not stuff I think happened, but these are actual documented news stories that took place in those days. So I tried to just correlate the two. Mm -hmm. So the moment it rained 100 millimeters, uh, those of you who are familiar with Bangalore, uh, there's a Gali Anjaniya temple out on Mysore Road, that gets flooded. Anytime a decent amount of rain falls, that gets flooded. Now, that in itself is not a big deal, but to me, it's like a barometer. Once that gets flooded, the slums that are next to it get flooded, walls get washed down, <coughs> people are homeless, some die. Um, all our stormwater drains overflow. And like I said before, this 100 meter thing is not a freak occurrence, it happens all the time. Anytime, so I've actually put this at 10 millimeters, I think it's a little lower, even 5, 6 millimeters of rainfall and our traffic is disrupted. Think of the opportunity cost and the economic cost of that. Uh, this was a really a freak occurrence where there was only 10 millimeters of rainfall recorded at the Bangalore station. Uh, it might have been 20, 25 at the location, I think this was close to Hebal where in an illeg illegal tenement on a construction site, two people die. So 30 millimeters of rainfall, maximum estimate. If people die, it's a very serious problem. Thousand, uh, one meter of rainfall over Bombay, people die. Okay, I mean, we can understand it. This, uh, I'm not very comfortable with this. So, while all this is happening, I mean, what does our city do? Um, on this day in September, the BBMP decides to start picking potholes. Um, and after all the stormwater drains have been flooded and they're overflowing, people discover stormwater drain irregularities in contracts and in money spent. By the way, uh, Bangalore has spent over 400 crores in the past five, five, six years on stormwater drains. You tell me what's the result. So uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that all these, you know, Daily rainfall analysis are not just cute or meant for, you know, people who love data, but they have serious policy implications as well. So this is something different. This is something, um, if any of you are interested, I'd love your help. It's uh, something I did in Bynard where you map this daily rainfall pattern over the traditional calendar. Uh, from what Vishwana told me, even the GKBK here in Bangalore has done it, where a lot of farmers sort of understand rainfall as having occurred on certain nakshatras in certain months and uh, on certain star signs and so on. And they, a lot of that is very, very scientific and true. I mean, they know from experience. But there's a big disconnect between that and modern scientific knowledge and research and so on. So if we can bridge that gap. So I've just done it for Vinod. And so here the economy is such that people's lives revolve around the climate. I mean, important festivals like Vishu are, I mean, if enough rainfall doesn't happen, then the festival cannot be a success. Can I just interrupt here? Can, can this be correlated to, uh, let's say, data in the last 50 years versus data in the, in the, the more recent 50 years? 
would that could also show us that, that there has been some change in the climate pattern or the rainfall pattern, and maybe this thing is really not applicable to some extent. Uh, yes, we can look at that. With why not, we did sort of look at it. I mean, we had only 28 years of data, okay. so we did what we could with what we had. And uh, you don't have dramatic changes everywhere. You have very subtle changes happening. Uh, and what the traditional calendar gives you is an excellent benchmark to give causal links. Mm -hmm. So you say you have a data change and you have something happening on the ground, people changing farming patterns. This gives you a metric by which to vet traditional knowledge and community knowledge. So if this can be done across India, I mean, it would be a phenomenal thing. And I just want to leave you with this where I have shown you all these day, uh, nice looking daily averages everywhere, but each year is fundamentally unique. This is, these are just running monthly averages from Bayanad where it shows you that each year it's like a signature. I mean, it's completely different. So, I mean, we need to sort of keep that in mind when we do all of our analysis. I just want to end by saying that, so we have an initiative that's sort of being incubated called knowyourclimate.org. We eventually want to have like a visualization interface for a lot of these graded data products. And I'm looking for people who volunteer and help us with it. Thank you.